Shalom. I'm Dr. Noreen Jacks, welcoming you to Bible Interact Presents. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast, which I hope and pray will be a blessing to you. It certainly was a blessing for me to prepare it. We have been studying the Gospel according to Moses. This is a study of the tabernacle in the wilderness. You have tuned in for session four, the tabernacle coverings. There were four porpoise skins, ram skins, dyed red, goat skins, and fine linen. Each of the four tabernacle coverings proclaim a prophetic, symbolic message pertaining to some aspect of Yeshua's humble life and redemptive death and resurrection. All of the four coverings will be discussed in this session, beginning with the outer covering and going inward. Just as in the Garden of Eden, when God covered Adam and Eve with animal skins to hide their nakedness and shame in Genesis 3.21, the animal skins in the tabernacle also speak of the necessity of sacrifice and the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22 addresses this. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We'll talk first about the covering of the porpoise skins. Now that we have entered the courtyard in our virtual tour of the tabernacle, we are in full view of the portable tent that must be erected and disassembled solely by the Levites according to precise, divinely established regulations. The first thing we observe is the covering of porpoise skins that forms the roof of the tabernacle. Although the porpoise skins is the fourth and final covering, we will discuss it first because it is the first covering that is visible from the outside. The outer covering of the grayish blue porpoise skins was bland and dull in appearance, offering no allurement to the eye to enter within. It was only after one crossed the sacred threshold that he would realize and appreciate the beauty within that was hidden from the unredeemed world. How perplexing this outer covering must have appeared to the pagan people groups who witnessed the tabernacle spectacle as the Hebrews made their way through the desert. Why would a plain structure be the center of Hebraic worship? Little did the pagan populace know of the awesome glory and power that dwelt within the somber exterior the point being, only through faith can one encounter and begin to comprehend the beauty of holiness. The plainness of the outer covering of the tabernacle reminds us of the human nature of Yeshua. The Savior of the world came to earth as an ordinary man with no respect to grandeur, in spite of his royal heritage both in heaven and in earth. His humble life stands as an eternal example to his people. I'd like to read now from Isaiah 53, 2, concerning Yeshua, from the prophet Isaiah. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. And also in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, we read, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Now I would like to share with you a very profound quote from the unpublished work of Moses Tabernacle entitled, Come Meet With Me. This is by the now deceased pastor Alvin Sprecher. And from him we read the following. The covering of the badger skin tells us loud and clear that lack of humility is the greatest hindrance to a blessed and fruitful ministry. This is not a humility that is paraded before the eyes of man by trying to act humble, but one that becomes part of our nature through Christ. 
the badger skin tells us that we must learn this at the school of our Lord. Praise God. Now in Matthew eleven twenty nine, we read from the words of Yeshua, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's look at the word badger as translated in scripture. Sometimes it's translated as badger, porpoise or badger. Uh, and the word is tachish in Hebrew, and it's leather from a porpoise or a badger, or even from a sheep. So you can see from this definition that the exact identification is speculative, but many scholars believe the exterior tabernacle covering was made from porpoises' skins. The important message we glean from the use of leathery covering in the tabernacle is the mercy of substitutionary sacrifice. Countless innocent animals were slain on the brazen altar as a temporary appeasement for the sins of humanity, but only the sacrifice of Yeshua could attain for all the sins of the world for all times. According to John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The leather skin declares another timeless message to the children of God. The prophet Ezekiel informs us that God shod his people's feet with porpoise skins, the same durable waterproof skins used for the outer covering of the tabernacle. And he did this for them during their wilderness trek through the wilderness for 40 years. This is recorded in Ezekiel 16, verse 10. Now the fascinating marine life, the porpoise, thrived in the Sea of Reeds and in the Nile River. So there would have been no shortage of porpoise leather in Egypt when the Hebrews gathered the spoils of war. Now the sojourners expected to use that leather for shoes, probably the greatest necessity in the desert other than food and water for a prolonged trek through the rocky wilderness of Sinai, or so the people thought. God, however, had a higher purpose for the porpoise skins. They were needed for the top covering of the tabernacle to protect the beauty within from the harsh sun, the wind, the rain, all the elements outside. And what could make a better waterproof material than a marine animal skin? At first glance, it appears that God expected his people to journey without additional shoe leather. Can you imagine the mumbling and the grumbling of the people? I can almost hear them crying out, we'll soon be barefoot. We can't climb over the rocks without shoes. What is God trying to do to us? And if we're honest, most of us would have been muttering and sputtering and hollering right along with the rest of them. God, however, was working upstream on the needs of the sojourners, and he had a better plan as always. Once the people surrendered their porpoise skins to the Lord, they had no further concern for shoes, according to the following passage, which is quite thrilling. Deuteronomy 29, verse 5. I have led you 40 years in the desert. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals has not worn out on your foot. Imagine. And the miracle gets even greater, even more fantastic, when we read Nehemiah's account. Not only did the clothing and shoes and the wilderness wandering endure for 40 years, their feet did not swell. Nehemiah 9, verse 21. Indeed, 40 years you provided for them in the wilderness, and they were not in want. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet swell. What a God! Now, the porpoise skins were also used to cover the tabernacle vessels and furnishings during transport. The protective nature of the covering reminds us that Yeshua shelters his people. Believers can rest assured that the Almighty has gathered them under his feathers like a mother hen. I love this passage in Psalm 91, verse 4. He will cover you with his pinions, meaning his feathers, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. And there was also the covering of ram skins dyed red. 
Exodus 36, 19 says that he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red. The ram was a ceremonially clean animal used in the trespass offering of Leviticus chapter 5, verse 15. It was also used in the burnt offering, Leviticus 8, 18, and as the peace offering in Leviticus 9, verse 4. Earlier in Israel's history, the ram was sacrificed on Mount Moriah by Abraham as a substitute for the life of his son Isaac, thereby painting a prophetic portrait of Yeshua, the sacrificial Lamb of God, the final substitutionary sacrifice for humanity, according to Genesis 22:13. Here we have Abraham now in Genesis 22:14. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided, Yehovah Yirah. Now the covering of the ram skins dyed red speaks of the shelter and protection that the priest experienced as they ministered before the Lord in the tabernacle while pointing prophetically to the future atonement of Calvary that is available to all repentant sinners today. The covering also speaks of the suffering and surrender of Yeshua and of our suffering and surrender. The personal sacrifice then is the humble goal of the Christian. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20 God does not delight in blood offerings, but in the broken and contrite heart that is totally yielded to his perfect will. Psalm 51 to 16, verses 16 and 17 addresses this concept. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Now let's look at that term broken. In the Hebrew, it is shavar, meaning to break or to break in pieces. So it's the idea of totally crushing, being crushed with the weight of our sin. And the word for contrite is defka, meaning to crush to pieces or to collapse. So here we have two words with the same apparent meaning, one of which is repeated twice, shavar, broken. And so the similar message is repeated three times in totality to get the reader's undivided attention. Emphatic repetition in the Hebrew scriptures seeks to initiate a response from the reader. So I'm urging you to allow God's word to minister to your heart and draw you closer to total surrender. The prophet Samuel understood this message and he said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. That is from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. The Torah draws our attention to the fact that the ram skins are no longer in their natural state. We are told they have been dyed red. The act of dyeing something completely changes the color. It changes the nature of an object. It's no longer the same. Like the Greek term baptizo, meaning baptism, we must be completely immersed in God until we are no longer the same. Baptizo means to dip submerge or immerse. It speaks of sunken vessels or of the act of dyeing cloth. Once a fabric is placed in a vat of dye, its color is forever changed. The same can be said of a true believer who has yielded to the plan and purposes of God in much the same way that our two craftsmen, Bezalel and Aholiab, yielded themselves totally to the Almighty. The man who has done so is no longer the same. He is forever then under the blood covering of the Lamb of God. 
Now the goatskin covering was the largest covering completely ensconcing the tabernacle to the ground. According to some scholars, the goat skin may have come from a species with long, white, silky hair, similar to Angoro goats. If so, this covering was not only beautiful, but strong and durable as well. It is also possible that the goat skin covering was black, which would have made a striking contrast with the pure white linen curtains beneath it. If so, we see a sharp polarization between sin and holiness in the two coverings. The Torah informs us also that women had a role in spinning the goats here. We read this in Exodus 35, verses 25 and 26. All the women who were skilled in spinning yarn brought violet, purple, and bright red yarn and fine linen, which they had made by hand. All the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goats here. So it appears that the spinning of goat's hair required special skill and anointing as did every other aspect of the tabernacle construction. Likewise, women of God are also used by him today in mighty ways. Here we have the scapegoat, a visual of it, and the scarlet cord of redemption. Note the scarlet cord tied around the horn. Every year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest of Israel, Kohen Hagadol, took two innocent male goats, as identical as possible, for a sin offering, and he took a ram for a burnt offering. The ram was sacrificed for the sins of the high priest and his family, and the sacrificial goats were for the cleansing of the nation. Now we have the scarlet cord, which symbolizes blood. As I said, it was tied to the neck or to the horn of the scapegoat, and a corresponding cord was attached to the gate of the tabernacle or to the temple door. Tradition claims if the cord turned white, Israel's sins had been forgiven. Tradition also claims that the cord ceased to turn white at the time of Yeshua's crucifixion and for all the remaining years until the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. The motif of the scarlet cord of redemption runs all the way through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 discusses this. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. The high priest laid his hand heavily on the head of the scapegoat symbolically transferring the weighty transgressions of the people to the innocent lamb that was then led off into the wilderness and released, never again to return to the camp of Israel, hopefully never again. The blood of the Lord's sacrifice atoned for sin, while the exiled scapegoat represented the banishment of sin from God's presence, according to Leviticus chapter 16, verses 5 to 10. No way did they want that, sin, that sin-laden goat to return to the camp. Now we read that, Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord, and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goats, and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. And with his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times, and cleanse it from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrated. And when he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all of the iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Because the goat was a sin bearer in the tabernacle and temple ritual, we immediately think of Yeshua's redemptive ministry and the covering he provides for the faithful in every age. The redemptive ministry of Yeshua is present symbolically and prophetically in the two innocent goats that bore the heavy price of sin on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Like the goat, 
uh, that was for the Lord, Yeshua, was sacrificed for the sins of this world. But he lives again in his resurrection, in his glorious resurrection, as foretold by the redeemed scapegoat for Azalel that was led away, led away unharmed. Through the miracle of salvation, the sins of the faithful have been removed as far as the east is from the west and a measurable distance, according to Psalm 103, verse 12. Now let's look at the embroidered covering. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. You shall make them with cherubim, the work of the skillful workman. Exodus 26, verse 1. And in verses 2 and 3, we read, The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain 4 cubits. All the cubits shall have the same measurements. Another curtain shall be joined to one another, and another five curtains shall be joined to one another. You shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtains in the first set, and likewise you shall make them on the edge of the curtains that are outermost in the second set. You shall make 50 loops in the one curtain, and you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite each other. And that's from verses 4 and 5 of the same passage. Now, in the next verse, we read, You shall make 50 clasps of gold and join the curtains to one another and the clasps so that the tabernacle will be a unit. So we have 50 loops joining the curtains together. This speaks of Pentecost or Shavuot on Mount Sinai. 50 days after Pesach, after Passover, when God gave the law to Moses. That's recorded in Exodus chapters 19 through 24, which I encourage you to read as you go through this study. The spiritual fulfillment of Pentecost occurred 50 days after the crucifixion of Yeshua, following an intense 10-day prayer meeting in Jerusalem. That is recorded in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When Pentecost, the 50th day after Passover came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a violent blowing wind came from the sky and filled the whole house where they were staying. Tongues that looked like fire appeared in them, to them. The tongues arranged themselves so that one came to rest on each believer. And all the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. Praise God. What a miracle that day. Now look at the tongues of fire in this graphic coming upon each believer, upon all the faithful at the Feast of Pentecost. The 50 loops also speak of the Jubilee year that occurred every 50 years. Jubilee meant freedom from debt and slavery and restoration of property rights. Yeshua's sacrifice was the ultimate liberator when he delivered his people from death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Leviticus 25.10 says that you shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. Beautiful embroidered curtains covered the ceiling of the tabernacle, falling almost to the ground. Images of cherubim or cherubim in Hebrew, hovering over the holy place and the most holy place, were skillfully stitched on a finely twisted linen. The cherubim are regarded as the guardians of the holiness of God. And it was the cherubim with flaming swords that guarded the Garden of Eden following the exile of Adam and Eve. That's recorded in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. After he drove the man out, Elohim placed angels and a flaming sword that turned in all directions east of the Garden of Eden. And he placed them there to guard the way to the tree of life. Now let's look at this word cherubim or cherubim, as I said, it comes from keruv in the Hebrew meaning an angelic being or a guardian. And I'd also underline the word shamar, which means to guard. The cherubim were guards 
um, uh, the shamarim, we would say, they were guardians, protecting and treasuring, keeping, observing. This is a word also used of soldiers who guard their post. The shamarim and the kerubim, they were guarding the presence, the holiness of Almighty God. It is believed that Ezekiel's visions of the four living creatures, a man, a lion, an ox, and a vulture, was that of the Caribbean in Ezekiel chapter 1. The angelic being guarded the holiness of God also above the Ark of the Covenant. They were also on guard duty in heaven. Now we read in Revelation 4, 6, and 7, and before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass as clear as crystal, in the center near the throne and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a young bull. The third had a face like a human and the fourth was like that of an eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and were covered with eyes inside and out. Without stopping day or night, they were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. We have much more on this subject, and there'll be much more on this chapter in the workbook that I hope you will purchase. And in the meantime, uh, just think about what you have learned today. Meditate on the precepts, reread the scriptures, and uh, perhaps even listen again, and trust the Lord to bring you into closer intimate relationship with Him as you seek Him with your whole mind, heart, soul, and strength. Shalom. Bible Interact is a group of Bible scholars and biblical archaeologists who promote the Hebraic nature of Scripture and view the two Testaments as one unified message. They explain how they use a first century approach to searching the Scriptures, and they share their methods and discoveries for discussion and dialogue. They invite your comments and participation on BibleInteract.tv, where you can also find more teachings, self-study quizzes, webinars, and interviews. 